Welcome, Joshua, to uh, Microsoft in, in Redmond. Uh, you've been here as part of our Microsoft AI's Distinguished Lecture uh, series and gave a fabulous talk yesterday Thank to a, a standing room only crowd uh, here and spent time with our researchers and, and engineers. And I want to th uh, thank you for taking this opportunity to share some of your insights uh, with the broader community. So we're here in, in part because of the role that you've played as an amazing leading figure in uh, a real transformation that deep learning has enabled in the last five to 10 years. And you think about the uh, capabilities that computers now have from speech recognition, speech generation, image analysis, even real-time translation from one language to another. Mm. I mean, there's a whole generation of people growing up who think that you can pick up a phone, say something, and something re magical will happen most of the time. 10 years ago, that was inconceivable. Um, and you must be proud, excited, exhilarated by this. Um, but you've also, this is not something that you've taken up recently. You've been in the field for a number of years. I did the wrong math yesterday and said 25 years, but you corrected me and said it's 30 years. Can you say a little bit about uh, you know, what's motivated you over the years to continue to think about uh, human intelligence, machine intelligence, and how we can uh, leverage insights from, from both of those? Right. So when I read these first neural net papers mm -hmm. around 1985, yeah. 1986, it was a uh, passion. I mean, like I, I, I didn't know what to do for my grad studies and suddenly I knew. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so these are the Rommel Hart McClellan yeah, and, and early yeah, papers yeah, and yeah. Jeff Hinton and folks right. like that. So yeah. Jeff Hinton was a huge inspiration uh -huh. for me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the whole uh, connectionist group. Mm -hmm. The, the PDP book was my Bible. <laughs> the two volumes. The two volumes, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. And one of the reasons I was attracted um, beyond the AI and my, my uh, adolescent interest for science fiction <laughs> was the idea that by studying this field, not only would we'd get a better understanding of intelligence for building machines that could mm -hmm. be useful for humans, right. but also it will help us to understand our own intelligence, uh -huh. as, as intelligence is something so central to uh -huh. what humans means. You focus mostly on the former of those? You still have a yes. deep passion for the, the latter? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously I had to make a choice, and <laughs> I, I, I was more of a nerd than, <laughs> than, than somebody, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, attracted to psychology and things like this. Uh -huh. Um, but over the years, probably again following the inspiration from Jeff Hinton, mm -hmm. I've always kept close proximity to neuroscientists, mm -hmm. cognitive right. scientists. Right. As you may know, we um, set up this program, uh, CFIRE program, right. which brings together AI right. and machine learning uh -huh. researchers with uh, neuroscientists and, 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 and kind of scientists. Uh -huh. Can you say a little bit about your thesis? Because in many ways, it, it bears a, at least a surface level resemblance to many of the things that are going on today. Can you just <laughs> sure. So, so in, in my thesis, which I started in uh, 1986, okay. <laughs> uh, well, actually, that, that was the master's thesis, and, and I did the PhD. At, in okay. Canada, we do master's and PhD, so, and I finished in 91. I was, uh, so during this five years, I was working on speech recognition, mm -hmm using recurrent neural nets uh, with a sort of convolutional architecture uh -huh. was before the modern architectures, uh -huh. obviously, and, uh, and probabilistic models, hidden Markov models, uh -huh. with the neural and, and the probabilistic pieces being integrated. That was my main contribution, uh -huh. how to train these things properly. Uh -huh. um, and um, it gave me a lot of hands-on experience with uh -huh. the difficulties of training neural nets. Uh -huh. And in particular, I stumbled upon the, 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 the difficulties of training recurrent nets on mm -hmm. long sequences. And a few years later, I published a number of papers on that right. subject, which became very, very well cited. Uh -huh. Good. So in, in the last 10 years, we've really seen a transformation of, of some of those ideas and, and roots take place. What, what do you think the top two or three things are, either technical or uh, social, that have enabled that? That have enabled, enabled the, the amazing revolution that we've seen in ah. the last uh, decade or so in, right, right. in deep learning. 
Well, th these things have been said before by many people. <laughs> of course, there is a alignment of planets, um, <laughs> and uh, it's it's been technical progress on the algorithms, the amount yeah. of data, the, the computing power. If we focus on the algorithms, there is, of course, what gave the, na the name mm -hmm. deep learning, depth, which right. has been a, an intense subject of study mm -hmm. from the beginning and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and of interest to, you know, why would it help? And, and, and this idea that I continue pushing today yeah. that what we should be striving for right. are machines that discover better representations that are more and more abstract. Right. And uh, the other idea that we had at the beginning was that mm -hmm by stacking these layers on top of each other, we will build more complex abstractions on top of simpler right. ones. So, so that's a very central thing. Yeah. And, and now we understand it better mathematically, theoretically. Uh -huh. But there were a few really important um, uh, little technical things yeah. that completely changed the way we, we, are, we are approaching applications and our success in, mm -hmm. in many uh, cases such as the use of uh, rectifiers, the, the ReLU and yeah. so on. And actually, um, my student Xavier Gloreau and I were the first to show that, hey, if you use these piecewise yeah. linear networks, you can really train deep nets, whereas if you had the hyperbolic tangent, it didn't work. Right. So, and we don't yet understand, we don't have good theory <laughs> to understand that yet. And this was 2010. So still lots of work to be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, and then I would say another great contribution to today's success for many uh, models, mm -hmm. not not for computer vision, but m yeah. more on the language side, is the yeah. use of attention mechanisms. Uh, as you said, that's been uh -huh. crucial for machine translation, for example. But uh, it's mm -hmm. it's now used uh, everywhere we want to handle more complicated data structures mm -hmm. than, than than simple images or. Or, sequ or sequences. Okay. Um, so that's that's interesting because it, it's changing. These uh, these things are really changing the face of neural nets as uh -huh. I was using them in the late 80s uh, during my PhD. It's, uh, they used to be pattern recognition machines yeah, yeah. and the first successes with speech recognition, for example, and then with, with object recognition and images, yeah. we're really focused on this pattern recognition ability. Right. But if you look at what people are doing now, uh -huh. and, and for example, applications uh, in, in um, natural language, like machine yeah. reading comprehension, right. and even in uh, complicated models that involve uh, reinforcement learning mm -hmm. or memory, right. uh, the, these, these notions of attention become really, really useful. Okay. Thanks. And you shared yesterday with us some of your, uh, you know, insights uh, about um, moving from the remarkable progress we've made in, in pattern recognition to much um, higher level cognitive capabilities, in large part by abstraction, and talked about a couple of what are essentially priors that one can use to constrain what it is that a, an, uh, an agent acting in the world would need to, to learn. Can you share some of those uh, sure, broad ideas with the, the audience. So, so first of all, I mm -hmm. think the idea that machine learning is built by combining the right mm -hmm. priors yeah. and, of course, you know, bringing the data on top mm -hmm. of that is something that is not sufficiently appreciated. Some some people think that oh, we got this magical universal recipe that's going right. to solve our, <laughs> all of our problems. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> There is this uh, dream of tabula rasa machine learning, right. but it, it, it just doesn't make much sense. And uh, instead, what we're doing in practice is coming up with sometimes very domain specific and, and hopefully more general uh, constraints or a priori or assumption yeah. that helps structure the model so that they will generalize very, very well. Right. In fact, depth itself is an example of things like that. And what I talked about yesterday are priors that we can put in the architecture, the training framework mm -hmm. that hopefully help the, the, the learners, mostly unsupervised, but it could be also supervised or reinforcement learning, uh. to discover better representations. Okay. And better means that in the represented space, you could hopefully predict more easily. Uh -huh. you, those predictions could involve very few variables. So this is the consciousness prior. Right. 
or these variables would correspond closely to aspects of the world that mm -hmm. can be controlled by the agent. So th these are the, the kinds of ideas that, that uh, I'm, I'm exploring these days. Okay, and again, to pop a, a, high, uh, a level a bit, the, the goal of a lot of this work is really to um, enable machines to come from some of the very simple and perceptual tasks that they, they do very well at now to achieving um, kind of the level of higher level abstraction and common sense that even toddlers um, yeah, have. we are far so, <laughs> from uh, building machines that have the learning capability of toddlers. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can do a lot of engineering to solve specific problems yeah. and bring in tons of data and mm -hmm. do a lot better than toddlers or sometimes even better than adults. Right. But, but toddlers are still hugely better at quickly learning new tasks, quickly learning mm -hmm. language, which is one of the things right. I'm interested in. And we don't know how they manage that. So uh, one thing that I think we need to mm -hmm. pay more attention to mm -hmm. is some of the older ideas uh, from AI and cognitive science, which have been sort of forgotten, forgotten with all this <laughs> modern deep learning. Yeah. And uh, we need to find a way to augment the, the deep learning concepts that have been very successful. Right with uh, some of the objectives that, that AI has set itself uh, to solve without losing all of the advantages of better generalization right. and so on, uh -huh. capturing what looks like intuition, mm -hmm. which current deep learning is giving us. So do you think that involves a, a combination of neural and symbolic architectures or taking ideas from, from each of those? Uh, what, what do you think of the architecture of so there was a, 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 uh, a popular like. there was a popular uh, set of papers. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in, interest in in the '90s, trying to marry the, the neural with the symbolic, right. and there was like workshops and conferences yeah. and so on. It didn't really work, um, and I think maybe the mistake was to try to build some sort of hybrid. Uh -huh. Whereas I'm thinking more about. Um, a hybrid at a more abstract level where we take the concepts that have the, the principles that have worked mm -hmm. well in one case and, and in the other case and how do we build architectures that combine these advantages that for example mm -hmm. introduce in things like neural nets the notion right. of indirect reference which is central to yeah. symbolic processing right and it's quite feasible to design architectures that have this, it's just that people haven't explored that very much. So when you say indirect reference, reference you mean things like names. notions of objects and, uh, yeah. and, so, and, so and names, names and events. And, names, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so a name is something you can reuse in different contexts yeah. and that you can assign values, mm -hmm. you, can, um, you can do computation on the name itself, yeah. right? right? So, okay. so once you... Uh, um, bring the notion of name in the in the, in the neural net world. Yeah. It becomes just something we are familiar with, like embeddings. Yeah. Uh, because we want to be able to name a combinatorially large set of things. Okay. So now we see this kind of marriage coming. Uh -huh. Good. And so you're making initial strides in in in, in this area, and it seems like a um, a really difficult challenge. Partly because we don't know what the objective functions are, partly yeah. because, or, or they're distributed over time in many scenarios. Um, yeah. Can you just speak a little, give folks a, a glimmer sure. of, a, uh, sure. of what the future might hold in that area? So what we're trying to do is also move machine learning away from the raw perceptual space right. where all of our current training objectives are located, mm -hmm. like likelihood yeah. or even the GAN objectives, they're all like in pixel space. Instead, if you, if you consider what humans value, mm -hmm. how humans plan, how we, we check that our predictions are good and what kind of predictions mm -hmm. we're making, it's all happening in this abstract space. Right. We don't make T to T plus one predictions and unfold all of this. We like <laughs> directly predict things in some vague future, uh -huh. and we do it in this, uh, in this very abstract space, which doesn't need to describe every pixel. 
So, so this endeavor with, with for example, the, the, the consciousness prior is, is trying to design representation learning mechanisms that, uh, where the objective function is, is defined in that space. And, um, and that could be used, for example, in reinforcement yeah. learning where planning or um, unfolding into the future doesn't need to be uh, happening in, in, you know, like playing a movie in your head. That's not right. what's happening <laughs> right. in, in people's <laughs> minds, right? But, but rather something abstract that, okay. that uh, can refer to only some, only needs to refer to some aspects of the world okay. and not every little detail of it. Okay. So is work, for example, in program induction uh, central to these ideas, or is that a, a different way of approaching some of these, uh, you know, the ability to act in the world, understand the consequences of your actions, predict what, what might happen? Right. Or... So I think in program induction, mm -hmm. there is a, an approach in which we're working purely syntactically, which like we're doing with our current deep learning, uh -huh. where we are modeling sequences of characters that yeah. somehow uh, do ex correspond to programs, mm -hmm. and I don't believe this is going to work. <laughs> I think for program induction and, and as well for general AI, what we need is grounded language learning. In other mm -hmm. words, that the learner figures mm -hmm. out uh, at the same time as it's learning the language, like the, the, the symbols that, that uh, are being manipulated, right. it's learning what they refer to. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of program induction, that would be what the computation corresponds to, right. and then learns to somehow reason and, and, and act with, uh -huh. with that knowledge. Uh, in, in, in general language learning, I think this is something that's been discussed for many years, mm -hmm. and I see more and more papers in that direction. Right. I'm very encouraged by, right. by that direction from the community, and, okay. and I want to push that as okay. well. Good. So th this is a, I have a few general questions that I want to pop to. I mean, thank you for sharing some of the uh, insights about uh, you know, how you got into this area, your decade-long pursuit in, in understanding um, how people learn using inspirations from that to um, support the development of more intelligent m machines. Uh, but I want to uh, focus on a, a couple of other things. So one would be you right now in, in Montreal as, as a professor at uh, uh, at the University of Montreal, as the head of the MILA or broader organization, mm -hmm. um, as and as a you know me important member in in this community, um, have seen lots of students and and lots of collaborators. Can, mm -hmm. are, is there any advice that that you can offer to new people who are interested in the field, both at a, a technical level, so maybe people who would develop the next algorithms, but also people who are thinking about how to use some of the insights, shape insights for, for their problems? So first of all, there's a lot of information about mm -hmm. AI, machine learning, right. deep learning, reinforcement learning yeah. available out there for free. Uh -huh. I often get undergrad coming uh -huh. to me <laughs> from poor countries even, yeah. who got a lot of their information from the internet. Yeah. There are so many things, tutorials, videos, papers, mm -hmm. of course, everything is yeah. an archive in our field, it's right. amazing. And, and, and libraries, uh, yeah. open source code. So there's a lot of opportunity to learn by yourself. Okay. Um, and if you can afford a GPU card, even like a cheap one, you can actually do quite a lot in terms of learning. You won't be able to compete in, yeah. in some of these harder benchmarks, but you can learn a lot. You mm -hmm. can, you can, you can um, understand how neural net training is happening. So right. there's a lot that an individual who's motivated uh -huh. and has basics in computer science and, and math can actually learn by themselves. Uh -huh. That being said, uh, I see uh, an amazing progression of say some of those students who are coming to labs yeah. like mine and after six months, a year, two yeah. years of working in a group uh -huh. and, and, and there's this synergy that happens in the learning, the presence of people who know more than yeah, you, um, <laughs> environments in which you can speak freely, you can express uh -huh. your ideas and not feel judged. Right. I think transform these people into researchers very okay. quickly. And, uh, and so if you have a chance to go in, in, in an existing group, I think mm -hmm. it could be a big step in, 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 in your learning. 
So this is, uh, this is why students do grad studies. Uh -huh. And I know yeah. these days it might be tempting for many people to directly go from <laughs> undergrad or master's level <laughs> training to industry. But uh, you don't necessarily get that if, if you're going to especially become an engineer who applies these things. Mm -hmm. So depending on where you want to go, I think um, it, it's, it's something to think about. So it sounds like foundational skills, hands-on practice yes. um, for people who are more maybe research inclined, even being part of a, a larger um, intellectual and, yes. and open and sharing community. And reading, and right? Re so reading, okay. Reading, <laughs> reading, reading. I mean, this is not new. <laughs> Any scientist will tell you, right? You can't even stay on yeah. top of your science if you yeah. don't read like, at least 20% yeah. uh, of your time. Mm -hmm. Um, and in our field, things are moving so fast. Uh, I can't keep up with everything that's that's being written, uh -huh. obviously. Uh, so there's a social network. Yeah. Uh, I I get to know what to read because I talk to other people, <laughs> and, and I I tell them, oh, I read this, and you know, you should read it. And, and some of that happens online. So so reading and 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 getting inspiration, like reading groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to um, have guidance about what to read is, is really important. Okay. There are nice things like openreview.net right. where people in our field in, in the ICLR yeah. community submit their papers and then anyone can comment right. and you can read the reviews mm -hmm. online. Yeah. This, is, this is amazing. This yeah. is great. Uh, it, it allows for more participation. It allows for people to see what, how, how the process of uh, submitting papers and reviewing. Right. Right and analyzing what's going on and, and also just knowing, okay, I probably don't want to read this or, oh, <laughs> I didn't expect this, I should read it, read right. it. You don't need to read the whole paper to get a sense of what's, what's right. in there. You also learn a lot by people's comments on, on yes. papers and it's, yes. uh, you know, it, it's really interesting to, to see some of that in the open And you can have uh, anonymous comments, so right. that... For better or worse. <laughs> for better or worse, there are <laughs> positives and negatives. Yeah. I actually wanted to, uh, it, it, reflecting about the changes that have happened in the you know, last decade to support some real advancements in, um, in machine learning and, mm -hmm. and AI, uh, one of the things you didn't mention that I think is, um, is really important and that you've spent a lot of your energy supporting is a really open, um, agile, and, and collaborative in, environment, yeah. whether it's yeah. through tools yeah. you know, with Theano, through the book that you yeah. and um, Ian Goodfellow and Aaron Corville uh, published that uh, is one of the best sellers on, on Amazon. But also, uh, more importantly, the chapters are available for anybody to yeah, for uh, read free. without carrying uh, you know, necessarily the book around, to, uh, to new conferences to focus on representation learning, yeah. the open review process, um, even publishing early in archive. All of those have created, I think, a new energy in AI and, and machine learning that wasn't there before. Can, can, can you comment I'm on the how- I'm not the only one there. Uh, yeah. I, no, I didn't. It's, it's, but, it's, it's a community thing. Yeah. Actually, you forgot one thing. Okay. In uh, the late 90s, I <laughs> yeah. participated in the revolt of uh, the machine learning journal oh, the, board that led yes. to the creation of GMLR, Ch which is now yeah. the, f okay. the flagship journal. So you've always had learning. this uh, rebel so, uh, streak. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. maybe. Uh, <laughs> Oh, sort of open collaborative community. Yes, community. that's right. And that, I think it, and that yeah. has led, I think, to a lot of the, um, both to the insights, but also perhaps to a, a frenetic and unmaintainable pace. So, <laughs> yeah, there are yeah. good sides and bad sides. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think overall, it's it's helping the progress of science. Right. And um, it's it's helping making science more accessible as right. well, which is something I care about. Right. So some of what you're talking about is associated to, with a sense of responsibility that mm -hmm. I think scientists should have, and especially as right. they mature in their career, right. that uh, we can give back. Right. And um, the things that matter are not just how many papers we publish. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's hard sometimes for a uh, young graduate student looking for a position to, uh, to appreciate. Yeah. yeah. So actually, let me um, ask a, a final question that, that builds on that. So you know, it's clear now that AI is out of its uh, academic box and really having a profound impact on, on many um, aspects of society. You hear about it in, uh, in all sorts of uh, things ranging from you know, fake news to issues of fairness, accountability, and, and transparency and ethics. Um, 
Do you have any insights about how we as a research community and an intellectual community can help shape those outcomes for the, uh, for the better? I think there are many ways in okay. which researchers in this field can have a positive contribution mm -hmm. to the social impact and the ethical aspects mm -hmm. and uh, how what we, what we call AI for good, right. how AI could be used for, yeah. for the good of humanity in general. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I see, it's amazing, uh, a, a, a very rapid increase in the yeah. interest in these questions yeah. over the last 12 months, mm -hmm. even two years. One of the aspects that I'm thinking more about these days is how we should try to shift the, the kinds of machine learning problems on which we work towards like object recognition on ImageNet, uh -huh. towards problems that could have a big positive mm -hmm. impact in the world, and especially problems mm -hmm. that companies traditionally are not really interested in because there may not be any profit in the short term, mm -hmm. like humanitarian applications. So, so that's something I've been thinking about mm -hmm. and, and um, how we could help the poorest countries with, mm -hmm. with technology, with machine learning, right. with our skills, uh, how we could help the people in those countries mm -hmm. learn those skills so that they can help themselves. Right. I think there's a lot that could be done. And because these problems are not necessarily for profit, it would be easier for yeah. companies, the big, the big uh, IT companies, to mm -hmm. actually collaborate on these questions than the traditional applications where they're really competing against each other. Mm -hmm. So I, let's close on that uh, um, call to action for the, the machine learning and, and AI community to not just continue our technical excellence, but um, understand how we can really shape uh, people and, and society, which is certainly one of our passions here. Thank you very much. So thank Susan. you so much for your visit and for this uh, wonderful talk. My Thanks, pleasure. Joshua.